Good to Yuku, and welcome to Shape's belated NADOC Week event for 2020. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, sea and skies across New South Wales, and in particular the Kamaraigal people of the Aurora Nation from where our office stands. We'd also like to acknowledge the many traditional owners around the country from over 500 different clan groups that we have been or are working on and where you may be watching from today. We're grateful to those who have cared for, nurtured and protected this country for future generations and pay our respects to our elders past and present and emerging. They hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to, of this country. Today, we've got a very exciting panel discussion planned around this year's NAIDOC theme of always was and always will be. As one of the first companies in Australia to be granted access to LinkedIn Live, we thought it'd be a great way to share this information to our staff and our industry colleagues around the country and hopefully globally as well. So don't forget to post comments and questions on the way through our live feed and we'll endeavour to add them to the Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. So today we're bringing you a panel chat with some of Australia's Aboriginal sporting legends. In order of age, sorry David, this includes David Lydiard, OAM, former rugby league player for Parramatta Eels, Manly Sea Eagles and Penrith Panthers, as well as a few stints in the UK. He's also chairman of DLG Shape and an all-round great guy who has devoted his life to helping the Indigenous community. Second is Michael O'Loughlin, former Sydney Swans AFL player, who has a highly decorated playing career, as well as being a member of the elite 300 plus game clubs. He's had a total of 303 games for the Swans and only four players in history have reached 400 games. So it's a pretty elite club to be in. He's now the successful business owner of ARA Indigenous and as well as devoting a lot of time to charities, including his own Go Foundation, which he founded with his cousin, Adam Goods. And next is rising star of women's football, Jada Wyman. Jada is a professional football player, originally from Wagga Wagga. She's currently the goalkeeper with Sydney FC, having recently moved over from Western Sydney Wanderers in the National W League competition. Jada hopes to follow in the footsteps of fellow Aboriginal football star, Lydia Williams, who is the current goalkeeper for the national women's football team, the Matildas. So this discussion is going to be moderated by the Head of Marketing and Communications for Supply Nation, Jodie Taylor. Jodie is also a proud Aboriginal woman and former ABC journalist turned corporate affairs and crisis communication specialist with a particular passion for progressing Indigenous engagement and social change. Please welcome our guests and I'll hand over to Jodie. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I'd also like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands on which we are gathered today, noting uh, that we have various people tuning in from LinkedIn uh, and Facebook. So welcome. We'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. It's my absolute privilege to be here with you today and sitting alongside Michael Jada and David um, and looking forward to exploring various uh, various issues. But I guess on the back of uh, NAIDOC week and coming out of a very different NAIDOC week, I'm really interested to start the discussion by asking you how you each felt uh, given this year our, our week was moved uh, we couldn't have in-person uh, activities and our connection generally um, was quite challenged. So Michael, I might start with you. How were you feeling during the week? Um, great to be here. Um, I think, um, to answer your question, sorry, it was, it's been strange, it has absolutely been strange. But I think um, like everyone around, around the country and I guess around the world, the, the adaptability and being able to be flexible and um, to, 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 I mean, NAIDOC week's such a special week for our people, um, being able to educate, but also celebrate our culture, our history, uh, our survival. And it's been an amazing um, time on Zoom, lots and lots and lots of Zooms, like I guess everyone uh, around the country. But it's um, something that, you know, I think we've we've adapted to pretty well. Um, I've done multiple things over the last week and a bit now, and um, this is another one, and it's, it's strange. And sitting in front of, there's a couple of people here today, but um, I think um, with NADOC, yeah, I just you think back to uh, as a child the the, the march marches going out to um, celebrating with family friends and and um, through the streets of Adelaide where I'm from um, and it was it's it's completely different now isn't it I think it's strange for everyone but um, it's great we have forums like this today to, to to help keep on spreading the the message. 
And David, what about you? Uh, my members of NAIDOC, are obviously, uh, I, I walked across the Harbour Bridge, like I think it was 20 something years ago. Um, and I was surprised to see a lot of non-Aboriginal people in the crowd um, celebrating. So again, like Mickey O, I've, uh, I've done a few uh, things this week for NAIDOC in the Botanic Gardens. We were able to set up a makeshift um, sand pit and had a cultural performance down there at Selfie Point, they call it, near the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. Um, so, and, I, and I've been on a defence base as well to do a smoking ceremony. And uh, so it's been a pretty good week, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been tough, you know, for COVID. And Jada, what about you? What, how did you handle um, the week being so different from usual, usual years? Yeah, uh, I think I relate to both of them in the fact that we just did a lot of Zoom calls and everything like that. So, but the fact that we still pushed ahead and wanted to still make the message and put the message out there um, was fantastic on everyone's part behind the scenes. Um, and then for us, uh, I still got to go down to Dubbo. Uh, had the pleasure of going down there and did a clinic with some. Uh, it was also a, uh, Indigenous Football Week. So, um, yeah, having to go down there with the John Marity Foundation and really just kick around with the kids and still got to somewhat get back to normal I guess it was yeah it was amazing to have those um those uh connections with the kids as well so yeah and I don't know this might be more of a question for for you guys um as opposed to to Jada being our lovely young lady of of the group um but you know I've really seen people resonate the the themes of recent years resonate strongly with people particularly across businesses in the wider community always has always will be because of her um we can um why do you think that is and, and have you noticed that as well I, I just I'm just thinking from my own perspective when I started out back in uh the ABC Jana and I were talking the other day um when I was 18 back in the late 90s um you know, we did a lot at the ABC, but that's because they were quite progressive. And so Indigenous staff, we used to gather once a year. But outside of that, you never really heard about NAIDOC Week in the corporate sector. Um, Me to go? Yeah. Um, I think it's through that education piece. Um, I really do believe a lot of my friends growing up had no idea about NAIDOC. What does it stand for? What does it mean? Why do you guys, Aboriginal people, why are you doing the things you're doing? Um, we love learning about our culture. Uh, we love talking about our culture and being able to express that to friends uh, who might not necessarily know a lot about Aboriginal culture, it's, it's, it's amazing. And NADOC brings that to the forefront. And I've always said this, my culture is your culture, everyone's culture. Um, and we've got to go on this journey together. And it's a great way, um, I guess, for schools to also educate the younger generation who, who, let's face it, they get it. They don't see racism. They don't see, they just, if you're sharing your lunchbox with them or, or, or if you're going to kick the footy with them, that's all they see. It's not what they learn. It's all about what they learn at home and away from um, away from their friends. They don't care about black, white, red, green. doesn't matter to, to young people. Uh, it's only as they get older and the, that education around um, people, um, different uh, communities and cultures that um, it gets a little bit distorted, well, a lot distorted and, and, and we have a lot of issues. So... I love going to schools and talking to kids and um, they just want to know how tall you are and what's your favourite breakfast. And <laughs> so, and then we get the chance to express, you know, um, our culture and talk about it. I love doing it. Nothing um, makes me more prouder. And especially at home, and I'm a Narunga, Nuttingeri and Ghana man, and it's incredible to be able to go back and, and, and to be able to talk about that. So um, that's how I view NADOC um, and education sits at the fore for me. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the Go Foundation. We do a lot of that, um, you know, strength with culture helps you do anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I really love expressing that and talking to people about what it means um, to me and my people. And I actually want to come back on the Go Foundation. I've had the privilege of being involved and I'm a massive fan and I see the great work that you do. Um, so I do want to kind of come back in more detail on that. David, what about from your perspective? Firstly, I want to just sort of uh, acknowledge Mickey O. Um, I started an Aboriginal opera probably 25 years ago called NASCA, the National Aboriginal Sporting Chance Academy, after my footy career. And um, I got a phone call from the Sydney Swan saying, we've got this black fellow up here from Adelaide and uh, he's 17. I think he's going to go off the rails if we don't get him around some of his mob. <laughs> so look at that mischief. So, <laughs> I've sort of known Mickey O since he was 17 and he sat on my board and I think you were 
uh, maybe one of the longest standing board members. You were with me for 16 years. Obviously first cousin to Adam Goods and these fellas, you know, went out to community, did a huge amount of work over the 16 years he was with us at NASCA. But for the first two years, I thought he was a mute. He couldn't speak, you know, he just sort of sat there looking at people going, what, what's going on? But uh, he's come a long way uh, from uh, being a young 17 year old. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, Starting a not-for-profit after my professional career was uh, something I was a passionate about. I used to go out and uh, visit. I uh, haven't been to every Aboriginal community in Australia, but I've been to most of them now. And uh, for it to be still going 25 years, and, and I was proud to hear when he started the Go Foundation with, with Adam and what they're achieving with, you know, getting kids staying at school. That was, you know, it was around sport. You know, I was lucky, you know, I had a, a, a golf program hunting for Australian tiger because of Tiger Woods. I had a rugby league program because that's where I played and I had a netball program for girls. So now NASC is more about keeping our Aboriginal kids in school, making sure they get through school and then get a job and a career. That's what we're about. And I, I want to delve deeper into that as well. But Jada, I might throw to you, um, you're sitting next to two sporting icons um, who've also made significant traction, not just in business, but also community as well. And, and I think we're all going to love hearing a bit more about that. Um, so very different uh, paths on the surface, but I think a lot of similarities. And I'm really keen for you to share your story, how you started from, you know, trial, trying out rather as a goalkeeper when you were 10 to getting your big break in Canberra. Yeah, well, I, I originally grew up in Wagga Wagga. Um, I actually played Auskick uh, when I was younger. And then um, at that time, you could only play until you were about 12 as a girl um, because there was no mixed teams or anything like that. So my pop suggested that I give soccer a go. And um, yeah, so I was playing soccer for about a year in Wagga, just locally, and then trialled for the Wagga rep team. Um, there was no positions left uh, besides goalkeeper. So I was like, and it had the least amount of running. So I was like, yeah, that's my spot. <laughs> um, and yeah, so from there I represented uh, Wagga and then represented um, Riverina and then made my way up to representing New South Wales country as well um, at state title as uh, nationals. And um, from there I got scouted by the, at the time, the goalkeeping coach for the Matildas. Um, and he had a uh, goalkeeping academy in Canberra. Um, so he um, gave me a scholarship to go there and I, uh, my family were so supportive in that situation. And um, yeah, we were traveling up to Sydney every weekend and also Canberra. So I'd leave school on a Friday, train Friday night, train Saturday morning, travel to Sydney, um, Saturday Arvo, and then Sunday play a game and then all the way back to Wagga. Um, and I, everyone's like, oh, that must be like tough on you. And I'm like, me, I just got to sit in the passenger seat. My mum does all the driving. <laughs> Um, and not even that, my, I have three little siblings, so um, I ha like it wasn't just me that was doing this whole journey. Um, it was my whole family, and that was probably the the, what, the reason why I could really push myself and to be determined and um, I guess a little bit disciplined in that because I had the support of my family. Um, and then moving to Canberra, it was a bit tough there. Um, we ended up living in a tent for a few months. Um, it was nothing but the fact that it was just un um, unfortunate circumstances with my parents in between jobs. Um, but the main thing was that my family just, they're a bit hard headed and they didn't want to go back to Wagga or anything like that. So um, yeah, we stuck it out for a little longer. And the thing that actually got us a place to live in Canberra was um, sport. <laughs> my stepdad plays rugby league. So he was um, in a, he joined a rugby league team there and then they ended up finding us a place there. So it was, it was an amazing thing that sport also brings you those little aspects in life. Um, just being able to pull yourself out of something that's can be a bit dark at the time, but uh, you look back on it and then think about all the lessons that you learned from those kind of um, moments in your life. And then, yeah, so I guess from there, I then moved up to Sydney and had the opportunity to go to Westfield Sports and then um, then on to W League and had my debut at um, 16. So, yeah, it was really awesome. <laughs> yeah, very, very impressive. And those early days that you have spoken about, how, how do you think that they uh, inspired you? You know, how, did they define your journey in the sense of you mentioned strength? And I think, you know, that's something we hear a lot and is quite reflective of our culture really that strength and determination to keep going what, what how do you think that inspired and, and motivated you 
Um, I guess like you learn little lessons. Everyone goes through challenges in life. Everyone has dark moments in their life. And I never think we should shy away from that. I think everyone can learn a lot from those times. And um, the best thing I think also from um, our culture is that storytelling is a massive part of it. Um, it's about the lessons that we've learned from um, our, our ancestors and um, also nature and land and animals. Um, there, there's all, all these little dream time stories that you can learn little things from and that's something that's really resonated for me um, the time that I've grown up. For me, I've found that I haven't learned that much about my culture. Um, my pop teaches me as much as he can and it's not something you learn in school either, but um, it, it's something that, yeah, like I, I find it a bit hard to go, I don't know much about my culture. I'm Aboriginal, you meant to know everything about it apparently, but um, yeah, I've got to do my own research and it's been amazing to have like these kind of moments where I get to connect with um, Indigenous athletes who have been around, uh, along the same journey in a sense with um, your sport. So um, to learn little things like that is all, is very important to me. And your teacher, you, you were saying you don't know a lot, but you know, the, some of the coverage I was reading, you, you're already giving back so much in community and you're really quite active in community engagement, aren't you? How does that make you feel being in a position to be able to do that? Yeah, my, my family have always been uh, uh, pushing to make sure that we're always leaders in our community to be able to be role models I wouldn't ever consider myself one but like at the same time it's it's nice to know that you're making a difference um and it's there's um people like Michael um David and uh Kathy Freeman um like they're making massive um foundations that help kids and that's all I I, I wish I guess I had those times um had that support as well and I've always uh, the fact that I'm young, I guess, um, I just really want to take advantage of this time to learn as much as I can from people that um, have done so well in their lives. And yeah, it would be awesome to do the same kind of things and when I get older. <laughs> it's wonderful. And so David, I might go back to your early days. You spoke about establishing uh, Nashka and um, can you tell us a bit about your transition, that time when you were transitioning out of sport and what motivated you and, and if you can tell us a bit about your inspirations back in the day? I suppose I was uh, really lucky. I was I was graded at Parramatta when I was 19. I'm three months off 60, so it seemed like a very, very long time ago. It was. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Um, uh, I used to visit community and uh, seen what was going on out there. You know, I've, I've been out in Central Australia in remote communities where, at a time when they were sniffing petrol and it was horrific. Um, so I just thought instead of um, trying to go and get a job, I wanted to start NASCA. And I was very fortunate to meet Bob Hawke, who we've lost now, um, the Prime Minister in 1983. He presented my grand final medals. And there was another guy called John Brown, the Sport and Tourism Minister. He did the Shrimp on the Barbie ads with Paul Hogan. And uh, when I uh, retired, I was training at a like to train still and uh, I was helping a couple of young blokes out and one of them was a son of a very heavy hitter in a corp in the corporate sector of Len Lease. So we caught up, I didn't even know who Len Lease were back then, 25 years ago, but uh, so I got on, they got on board and uh, they've been one of my major supporters for NASCAR now for 25 years and uh, you know, what, what we do, you mentioned Dubbo and John Moriarty, John um, was my chair at one stage and my not-for-profit. So I've been fortunate to have some very high-profile leaders, Mick Gooder, the Human Rights Commissioner, Sam Jeffries, he's up in Darwin now, he's a Brewarana fellow and uh, really high up in government. And I was, you know, was uh, become friends. I took an Aboriginal group to the UAE on a tour. I was talking on a boat in the harbour and the, the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates, Saeed Al Shams, he was on the boat. And he said, oh, I'd, I'd want to learn more about your culture. I said, oh, who are you? And he goes, oh, my name's Saeed Al Shams. I'm the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates. He flew me to Canberra and uh, I went to have a meeting with him. And when I walked in, he, they picked me up from the airport in this flash limo. And he walked in and he, uh, he, he held my hand. And I thought, this fellow's trying to pick me up. <laughs> I was about two seconds off knocking him out. <laughs> Sat down and we had a yarn and you know, then they, they funded these amazing kids from uh, Jarrigan College up in Cairns, that Torres Strait Islander, a remote 
communities and we spent an amazing time in the UAE and had lunch with a sheikh over there and it's been phenomenal, you know, to be able to, when you give back, everything sort of seems to be, to come towards you when you're not taking and you're giving, these opportunities open up. So yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing journey. seem to have, um, I was thinking of a much more professional phrase, but you know, you've always had your fingers in so many different pies in terms of, um, from a community perspective, um, you know, which is fabulous. How, how have you found, has that just naturally evolved, as you said, as you've become engaged in projects? It's funny because I've wagged most of school and uh, my mother's Aboriginal, my father's English Irish. My father's a truck driver. Mum was illiterate because she was put in the back of the classroom with her nine brothers and sisters and given colouring books. So she's taught herself to uh, read and write. And she used to, I used to get flogged by my parents to go to school. Um, and to know that I've had a partnership with Shape for four years. I've um, had a not for profit that's been going 25 years. Like you said, I've, I don't like the fingers in too many pies scenario, but um, it's you know, like Mickey O. You're driving change across the diversity. Well, I just want people to see that Aboriginal people can get up and have a go, you know, like not just in sport, but in business. Look what this fellow's done. You know, this girl's going to do the same. And, uh, you know, we've got an opportunity hub, which Shape has been phenomenal supporting. Elvis, I mean, sorry, Michael Manicus, um, <laughs> has, these guys have collected so much stuff. For, you know, we mentor 1,500 Aboriginal students in 27 schools out in Wellington and Dubbo. I'm out there in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's called profit for purpose. I want to make a profit because I'm going to be 10 toes up soon. So I want to make sure I'm making money for my family to set my family up. But giving back, we employ uh, Aboriginal people in our businesses. That's how it works. You know, so. And I think your experience really shows, though, that we don't have to be defined by particular things, whether or not that's perception or industry or experience that, as you said, you've transitioned out of sport into these various things. Um, I think that that's a fantastic lesson because I'm a massive believer of, you know, if you can see it, then you will believe it. Um, and, and I think that underpins what you do at Go, uh, Michael. And I might ask you, because you've also made a beautiful transition from the world of sporting and, um, you know, pursued passions uh, around education and, and business. And um, I, I'm interested to hear about your story and how you were able to really pursue those passions because that doesn't always come naturally for, for um, professional sport people. I think um, David's right. Like, and you, you think about sport. Sport's been an amazing vehicle for our people. Um, teach us about healthy lifestyles. Got to go to school. Um, get that education, employment, everything. So sport's been a, a major v a vehicle. We saw it, it was surrounded um, uh, when I, in my community. I mm. saw really positive role models playing netball, football, basketball, and I didn't wanted to do the same. So I didn't know you could own a business at, you know, at 13, 14, 15. That was for other people, in my view. Mm. And it wasn't until I got to Sydney um, and I pursued this, this thing called AFL football with the Swans and I was always okay at that. That was going to look after itself a little bit. I had to learn about discipline and hard work and, you know, um, eating the right foods. I was just nailing the, the McDonald's at that stage because <laughs> I had some money in my pocket. And and it was drummed into me really early that you can't do that because your body's like a, a vehicle. You've got to refuel it with the right stuff. So all these little lessons are learnt. And then you see other examples of people who have retired and gone on to do things. And David was one of those guys for me. I saw, okay. David's now running a, a, a NASCAR and he's doing other things. And I thought, wow, I had no idea that our mob can do it because I was surrounded by these other things. And, and I said sport was probably the biggest one. Um, so I knew that towards the end of my career, as I was sort of getting slower and, and more injured, that I was going to do something else. The Go Foundation was one of those things. It's inbred and ingrained in us to share. It's not mine, it's ours. And that's been drummed into... All of us, as young kids, you got you know you got a piece of cake. You you got to share it with your twenty cousins. So <laughs> I was just having uh, a there and, cutting a cake into twenty five different pieces. Oh yeah, he doesn't have a message back. It's fine because I was uh, similar. You know, your people. He's always asked for favors and things. So um, <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where I just it, it's 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 quite simply it's just who we are 
and we do that really, really well. And sometimes to our own detriment a little bit. And so football was amazing, the foundation. I also wanted to be a business owner of some sort. And like football, I was really fortunate to meet some great people along the journey. The networking side of things has, has always been really, really strong. Um, so I needed someone to teach me about business and doing the things that, that they do. And if, as, as with a footballer, I got there at 17, had no idea how to train, play. I'd never played with men before. I came from a junior football league to now playing at the AFL. Had no idea. I was 70 kilo, skinny, and I mean, the weight changed a bit, but it's like it is amazing to be able to go. So the, there's evidence that if you work hard and you do these things in the process of, of doing those right things over and consistently over and over and over again, you'll be successful. And so in my brain, it's scarred in my brain now that if you if I do the right things majority of the time, I'm going to get I'm generally going to get right results. The ones the things that I'm looking for, and then you think back to what you were saying about um, your elders, like if it's if it's good enough for my grandfather at 15 to go and shear 100 200 sheep a day, it's good enough for me to go to school. So that was drummed into me really early by a great role model, my mother, uh, who raised six kids by herself. So. Um, as I got older, all these sort of things were, were, were really sort of branded into my brain. So um, football was good. That was brilliant. I loved it. There's nothing like, um, you know, playing at the SCG, MCG and winning a premiership and celebrating with your friends and, and, and also our fans were, were incredible. Then the foundation, so accepting a premiership medal, running a foundation and seeing 500 kids go on a scholarship that you provided to go to school, to complete school, then to go to university, it, they sit right next to each other. So, premiership medal and handing out scholarships. It is there's it is amazing. It is incredible, and it's one thing that both Adam and, and myself we absolutely love because we were we were in those shoes. We were that struggle, um, and you don't get anywhere without some of those bumps. It's how you uh, you deal with those bumps along and knocks along the journey, and and the resilience. We're resilient. Been here for thousands, thousands, thousands of years. Like we're resilient, and I think um, we just need to put our arm around some, some, uh, some of our, our younger generation. Just say, hey, you can get, you got this, you can do this. I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you the way. But you're going to have to do the work and roll your sleeves up. So, really simple lessons, and I think that's the way, the way I've always played it. Keep it simple, work hard, and get on with the job. And um, um, as I said, you surround yourself with good people. You generally get good results. And I love the work you're doing with Go because that everything you're saying is really that you're funneling that approach through Go, aren't you? Targeting the first child in a family, um, you know, to ensure that you're setting the tone, you know, setting the standards. And it's been amazing. The foundation, we were doing everything for everyone. And you know what it's like, David, running a foundation. You want to help everyone, but you, you lose focus. So we concentrated on education, scholarships, and we wanted more girls than boys. Uh, our, our younger generation, in particular our girls, get left behind. And um, we wanted to change that so we have more girls in the program than boys. And, um, and it was a non-sporting program. So you don't have to kick a footy to get a scholarship or throw a netball to get a scholarship. If you want to work hard and you're prepared to, to show up, because that's half the issue, showing up, um, I reckon if you can get anywhere in any organisation, show up, listen, learn, I reckon you can pick it up quite quickly. Um, but you've got to show up, you've got to be there. And um, just trying to open these doors, as David said, a great example, walking around Sydney when I, was, when I was 17 and all these big buildings, you know, like they're 30 floors. I'm like, wow, what are they doing? Those bloody buildings, there's got to be monsters in there. <laughs> and some of them are, but, but you go, how the hell do I get up on the 30th floor there? What are they doing? What are they like? So there's, there's no examples like that where I'm from. It's, it's where I'm from, you, you kick a footy and you throw a netball and go to school and you listen to your nana. Well, that's it. Mm. And then you'll be right. So being able to see an example and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these buildings doing this job, whether it be at accounting, whether it be a general manager, that was mind blown. I'd never seen that before. So when I saw David and saw others do it, I was like, wow, planted a seed and then um, away you go and, and hopefully that's what we can do with the foundation and, and obviously our younger generation who are pursuing their own dreams which is incredible but there's no substitute for any of it without hard work. I think that's a really um, uh, important point that you make about 
uh, not having anything to do with sport, with the program, and it's all about attendance and turning up because that in itself, and particularly because I know how much traction goes having in the community and how much impact, I think, you know, facing, um, turning those misconceptions around that we all have to look a certain way, that we all are into sport or we're not. And um, so I think that even though you're not saying it in those words, that's actually really helping the broader community to change those misconceptions. Oh, absolutely. Education, we need more of our people. Uh, we don't need any more rugby league and AFL and, and we need more soccer players and basketball yeah, players. And absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. we... And, and we, senior execs, right? So well, I've spoken to people before about there seems to be a lot of um, focus on traineeships and, and getting into an organisation. But once you get to a certain level, um, you know, no one kind of touches base with you because you've you've gone through a program, and so it's it's adjusting and tailoring the support for the different levels, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I picked up a. I had an event. We were launched by a company, the DLG Group, and Mickey O come and spoke, and uh, he made a comment that I've, I've stolen a few times, and I'm going to own up to it now. Um, he he wants more blackfellas in suits. Now, I, I was on like five different boards. I sit on the industry skills board around the vocational education and training. I don't know what they, I probably shouldn't say that. I do understand what goes on in that board meeting, I promise, but um, it's difficult. And uh, when you get blokes like an economist, like Scotty Jamison, the finance guy, I don't understand what they talk about, but that's okay because um, I'm sitting there taking it all in. Um, I, I was involved with the Aboriginal advisory board for NDIS our mob don't get access to critical services around disabilities. And uh, so where I've, like Mick, you know, I, I've had uh, a girls program, netball. I was fortunate to meet Sharon Finnan, who played for Australia. Marcy Ella Duncan was the first Aboriginal girl to play netball for Australia. And uh, they're out there paving the way, you know, this young girl's coming through the ranks and, uh, who knows what's ahead of her, I think great things. Can I ask you though about the inequality um, that we're still seeing when it comes to gender? So I think Jada, you know, you're a great example, so talented and passionate and, you know, giving back in terms of community engagement, but still working a couple of jobs on the side because the money just isn't there. Um, you know, how do we fight against that and how do we kind of level the playing field? Is there anything that business can do to be supporting women in sport? Uh, a bit more. Yeah, I think the fact that at yeah, the Good Foundation, it's the, um, they just push forward the, the fact that females are at the forefront of what they want to pursue as well. Um, not saying that men don't matter because every everyone together can really learn off each other and really push together. Um, taking that, it's like taking away racism, taking away sexism. Um, it shouldn't be uh, the colour of your skin or the way you look or what, um, how you look yeah and it's just the what a person holds as a as a soul as their skill levels um that's what's uh valuable to a business um that's what creates a different um sector in the fact that it's creative creativity um you want to build a business you want to build as a person um those things all work in together i think and that's what i'm learning at the moment um and like david said he just doesn't know what he's the well he said he knows what he's doing in the business <laughs> rooms, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think anyone from any age, any gender, um, should never be afraid to the fact that they don't know something. Um, everyone's always learning um, and stepping up saying you don't know something, that's an opportunity for somebody to educate you. If they put you down, that's them as a person and that shows how they are as people. But um, I think in our culture, it's more about empowering, lifting up, building that person um, up to be the best that they can possibly be. Um, and I think that's what uh, females are doing now. Um, it's not only football, uh, female footballers, they're not only just pushing themselves up, um, they're also bouncing off other sports, other sporting codes. Everyone's building up together and to be able to create um, a, a pathway where it's not 
into uh, amateur league, it's into professional, and then also being able to balance both, having the fact that I'm doing two jobs on the side, but then also my football. Yes, it's been a challenge, but it also teaches me a lot of different lessons. If I was to be in a business, how many different things would I be juggling at the same time? Um, it's all about time management and things I'm learning still at a young age, and um, but uh, hopefully I can just get better at it over time. Um, and yeah, it's just a way of I think everyone just needs to take on board that we're still learning and we're just building as a country and a, a, um, as a sporting code. And yeah. So one of the things, and I think that's fabulous. But how do we get how do we get um, women more recognised um, in business and on the sporting field? Do you think? Um, I guess my point of view. I mean, sorry for all the my brothers and all the other males out there, women just get shit done. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> they, 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 they just get it done. I know this is getting televised uh, across Zooms and, and, and all over LinkedIn and, and whatnot, but well, I've, just, I've just done it. Um, but, but my general manager, Suzanne Gretsch, she just gets stuff done. And that's who I want to be around. And that's, it's, it's, they raise us, they look after us, they feed us, they clothe us, they do all these incredible things. They just get things done. We're idiots. Um, it, it's, <laughs> I was going to agree with you, but I'm not um, idiots. Um, <laughs> no, and you know what? I was, I was nodding my head, but what I was nodding my head about was the first time I actually met Michael and Adam, and much to uh, people who I knew who were, you know, mad about AFL, and I had to put my hand on my heart and say, look, I'm from Queensland, I don't know about it. AFL, but <laughs> um, but one of the things I think in the first two minutes of speaking to both you and Adam, you spoke about your mothers, and that touched me. And and you know I was a, a massive fan. It had absolutely nothing to do with your sporting background or or anything like that. And I think when we see more role models like yourself and and David, um, male role models, I'm talking Jada, um, who who just uh, display that level of, of behaviour, respectful behaviour in their everyday life, I think that just does so much for us as community um, because those younger boys are looking to you. Um, oh, it's, it's incredible. My mum packed my bags and, and put me on the old ANSET flight. Remember those guys? But, um, <laughs> um, but they, she put me on the flight. I was crying. I said, I'm, I don't want to go. And she said, mate, you're going to thank me for this one day. You've got to go. This is an incredible opportunity. She read the play when everyone else didn't. And she just said, mate, this is good for you. You've got to go be humble, be respectful and, 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 and work hard. And away I went and I called home every day pretty much. And she was like, mate, no one's here. So she kept on hanging the phone up. <laughs> but it was the lesson. So it was tough love, right? And um, she said, oh, you'll, th you'll thank me one day. And, you know, it was one of the, the greatest pieces of advice of, and tough love that I've ever had. So um, I think when we do the foundation, that's the, the lessons and the stories we share with our young girls and, and boys. Culture's at the front of it, but it's also, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? All we're doing is showing them what's possible. That door opens to that, that door opens to that, and these are the steps you need to take to get to that point. It doesn't just magically appear. You've got to put some process and, and thought around it, and part of that is showing up. If you show up, you can you can do anything. Um, because. Uh, our, as I said, thousands and thousands and thousands of years we've been here. We're resilient. We're smart. We're innovative. I mean, if you drop David and I off in New York with no money, we, we'll still get a feed somewhere. We, we would... Um, it, 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 oh, it's breaking injuries. It is. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't know why he said that. But, but, but it is, it is, it's about resilience and it's about all those things and we're bloody, we're good at that, right? So, I felt... I struggled with school. I was okay at sport, but I hung around very smart people. So I had a board of patrons. John Brown helped me put some very serious heavy hitters together, and they were all men. But, um, uh, you know, John Simon, the Aussie Home Loans trillionaire, uh, Jeff Dixon, the boss of Qantas, uh, Richard Longe, the chairman of Investec Bank. Um, Bob Hawke was on my board. Um, it was phenomenal meeting, having you know three lunches a year with these guys and having the opportunity to network and get to where I, I needed to 
you know, I needed, a, you know, my philosophy was if you don't ask, you don't get. So I needed to raise money for my not-for-profit to make sure we we're running programs to support the our, our, our youth. But um, uh, my businesses are, are, are run by women. And uh, I got, because of WAG school, I, I partnered up with Andrea Harms, my business partner, and she is the managing director of DLG. Again, I found El, um, Michael Manicus, who's, uh, you know, he's um, been working in this space for 30 years and uh, he could be a politician and uh, he's just phenomenal. So they're out there, you just got to find them and stick with them and uh, do your best, basically. And I think on the back of um, those words around resilience and connection being core components of culture, um, and certainly one of the things I was saying to, to Jada was, um, you know, we are still a small community and I think what we are all linked um, through is that desire to help each other, no matter what field we're in. And we've seen this with the relationship you and Michael in very early days and I did say that to Jada you know hopefully you'll be uh, here with the numbers of two sporting greats who can guide you and, and uh, provide you with some direction as well and you know if I can help you um, in any way I will because I think that's how we have to um, gain momentum by sticking together and helping each other um, and we're certainly seeing that resilience in the Indigenous business sector growing um, with the Black Lives Matter movement we are seeing uh, that momentum uh, continuing to grow, and I guess I'm interested uh, because that that can that momentum has obviously filtered through um, with the spotlight shining not just on Indigenous business but Indigenous issues generally. I think in Australia, and I'm interested to know how you think we can continue to keep that momentum going so that this particular time in place we're operating in such a, a unique uh, landscape. How do we ensure that it doesn't become a short-lived campaign? and people just move on to the next issue. Yeah, we've, we've got a thing called the Uluru Statement from the heart. So all of our leaders come together in Uluru and, and bought that. And I don't know where that's sitting at the moment. We've got some uh, amazing people in federal um, politics, Linda Burney and Ken Wyatt, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. You know, I've known him for 20 odd years. Um, so it's been a slow burn, but we're starting to get there. And, you know, there's amazing Aboriginal leaders out there, but we're spread all over. You know, we're 3% of the population, there's 26 million people. So we're, we're a minority group. But um, you now the fact that um, Mick has done what he's done and achieved, and, you know, he told me that he wants to have a big yacht with a big Aboriginal flag flying in the harbour and uh, to show people uh, look at me, look, look, look what I can do, you know. I think this girl has got the ability to do it as well. And, um, and you know, he's been an ambassador for Len Least, him and Adam, um, to be their rap ambassadors. All these, all these organisations are doing reconciliation action plans. Like my business now has done 60 reconciliation action plans for companies across the country. So I think it's slow, but... We're getting there. I don't know if I'll be around to see the change. I hope I am, but um, yeah. Yeah, for, for me, I think it's the the fact that we've pushed so far um, in in a short amount of time. The stolen generation only happened in 1970, finishing at 1970, and being the transition from then to now. Um, then we're fighting for our rights, fighting for different things in the community, and um, but now we're talking about how we can keep pushing forward. It's not necessarily fighting so much um, for big significant things but still fighting um, and, and it's making such a difference and the only things and like David said we're spread across all Australia and we're doing our little part um, where we can and when we can and it's making a difference not only um, in the community but it's changing people's minds and how they perceive different um, challenges in life um, and that's all we want to do as well. Um, I agree with both the guys. Um, I think when you see the papers, you always only see the mad, bad and sad of Aboriginal people. That's it. And it's not us. We know what the issues are and what, how we've been treated and how people have been treated. We need you guys, you guys, to come, to the, to come and have a walk on, on the journey with us and understand the things and the atrocities that have gone to our people. I've had an incredible life, brought up the right way. But my grandmother, my grandfather, 
my great grandfather, my great grandmother. So what they have had to put up with. So we know exactly what how, how Aboriginal people are being treated over this over the journey. David's right. The Illuminati uh, statement from the heart is an incredible piece. I highly recommend everyone have take a look at it. But we need everyone. So you know all these things that are happening to Aboriginal people. So come and help us. Or the other only conclusion I can come to in my mind is you don't care. That's it. It really is that simple. And how you educate and teach your children because they're gonna when once we're uh, once we're gone, they're going to be running the place. And I think that's really, really important. We have the oldest continuous living culture in the, in the world, in the galaxy. Some might dispute that one, but, <laughs> but the oldest continuous living culture, and we're still here celebrating and talking about our, uh, how proud we are. Now, you guys have got to come on the journey, or you don't care, really. Um, so really, quite simply, that's how I, how I feel, um, um, and I think, um, education plays a really crucial role around that. I think businesses are getting better. We're seeing great examples of, of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people doing incredible things. So it doesn't always have to be the mad, bad and sad of the front page of the, pa front page of the paper. There's got to be some great stuff up there as well, some great examples. Um, we talk about everything else, but I think First Nations people need to be recognised in that regard. Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned business, and I'm certainly not here um, to plug some pl supply nation in the sense of uh, a marketing spill, but we do have such diverse businesses um, who are affiliated with us. And it is about continuing to support our Indigenous business sector so that we can grow it and ensure its long term viability. Um, I do have a couple of questions I'm going to throw to you. Um, but, Michael, I wanted to ask you first, just on the back of that, you know, with the kids that go, what advice do you give them? I was going to ask what advice you give generally but I think because you're so hands-on with go what do you tell the kids in terms of um, thinking about the future and their aspirations on the back of what we've spoken about gone are the days where you just aspire to be a professional footballer or you just aspire to do a particular things how do you encourage that broadened outlook so people aren't bound or restricted by um, tape I think re relationships play a really important part of it so when talking to a, a, a kid and my own kids, they, they hate dad talking to them about examples of the way we grew up and, and what we went through and, and, and how lucky they have it. We always say that to our kids, don't we? You don't know how lucky you are. But um, it, I'm able to give them really clear examples that if you, no matter what your circumstances are, whether you're, 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 you're living with your nana or, which I did at some point because I was the eldest and trying to finish high school with five other younger brothers and siblings, uh, sisters running around, not being able to do any of that. Um, you can, if, you, if you really, really want to change the way your life and, and, and help your family, which I think we all want to do, um, you can, but you've got, you can't wish for it. You've got to make things happen. If one door closed, you, can't, you cannot uh, get disheartened. You've got to go and kick another one down. And, I've, yeah. and as I said before, there have been really clear examples in my life, in my lifetime, that that's happened. I, I, I know it works. It's it, the evidence is all there. So, um, want it? You dream it absolutely, but you got to be prepared to put up with some of the bumps along the journey as well. And um, it's how you deal with those bumps because you're going to get knocked back. You're going to be called this. You're going to be called that. And you're going to get the door closed in your face. It's how you react to that, and um, and get on with the job. It's it really is for me um, that simple. And I understand other people people have got different circumstances and going through some different things, but. If you're not happy, change it. How do you do that? Well, you seek the help that you need to get the things that you need to get done. I tell our kids, use Adam and I to get where you want to go. Use us. We'll, we'll help you with anything you want to do. Family got no money, we'll try and help you get an apprenticeship. Um, you take my call. No, 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 no voicemail. Leave a voicemail. I certainly wish the Go Foundation was around when I went to school, I have to say. Yeah, oh, look, we had we didn't have any of that. So, like, as I said, like, it was – I remember going around and knocking on my auntie's door for, hey, mum wants to know if you've got any spare bread and sausages and some potato and we'll, we'll, we'll look after you guys. So that's what community does. You help each other. And I was, like, looking at my friends who I went to school with, my, my, my non-Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander friends, and they had things. And I was like, damn, and I was actually embarrassed. And, um, and I was like, man, there's got to be a better way than this, better way than this. And then I was lucky enough that I could kick a footy, but I knew footy would only last for 10 years if I was any good. Lucky enough it lasted for 15. And then, so what are the other things? Do I then go off into the sunset with my, what I did with football? So um, 
I've got a big, big family. I'm related to everyone in Adelaide. And um, and it's quite amazing. Like having owning and running my own business, I make my I, I look after all the programs that I was in as a kid. So I look after the netball carnival, the junior netball carnival, the football carnival, the Go Foundations. Uh, I hired I've got a brother in, who's working in Adelaide for, and works for me. I've got another brother in Queensland who works for me. Both asked for raises the other day. Um, um, but that, do you know what I mean? Like, so. Um, and it's that persistence, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I, I still remember, you know, living in Cairns and, and not knowing anyone in the media, or, you know, not knowing anyone in the professional space and literally just rocking up to Channel 10 at reception, yep. volunteering to do voiceovers, and, you know, um, you know, putting on my public speaking voice and just knocking on every day by the end of the week. <laughs> I was on Channel 10, you know, doing a, their butcher ads. We're really good at. And I reckon people are we're really good at telling each other what we're really bad at instead of putting an arm around someone and go, hey, mate, I've seen you do that and I reckon you're not working hard enough. I know you can do better than that. Um, instead of yelled at and going, you're weak at that and you're poor at that and you're no good at this. So it's amazing what a little bit of encouragement does to, to people. Self-esteem, confidence, all that kind of stuff plays a huge part, I know. But there's going to be plenty of knocks and if you're prepared to roll the sleeves up and get to work, I reckon you'll... Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's going to be some success at the end of it. That's fabulous. Well, I have a few questions coming through from online, uh, and one of them: uh, How do you know you have found the right business partner and ensure they continue to deliver on both the business and the social and cultural uh, elements? And David, I might throw to you firstly on this one. I argue with my business partner every day, but she's always right, and I'm never going to argue with her. So that's the short answer. Not true, but um, that wasn't recorded. But uh, uh, look, I've, I've um, considering that you know I've got this partnership with Shape and Michael. I keep getting mixed up with Elvis Presley, but that's another long story. Um, so Michael does an amazing job, and when he on the phone call away if he needs me. Andrea is in Adelaide at the moment, and they're in six days lockdown. I was due to go down there next week, but that's not happening at the moment. So, but. Um, you know, I've, I've got a construction company and we're 80% of our employees are Aboriginal people. Um, it's, it's hard to sort of sit here and say when you say you've got your fingers in so many pies, but uh, it's phenomenal to know that I wag school was just okay at sport and, and, and ha have had a not-for-profit for 25 years and, and I'm meeting this amazing girl for the first time. Obviously, I've known him since he was 17. I've got him out of trouble, put him on my board, but um, I'm apparently his... Uh, role model or mentor, is that how it works? Or, yeah. <laughs> I've done an amazing job, I thought, I'd like to think. But, um, you know, to, to have the relationships and the partnerships that I've, I've got, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm a Pisces. I'm a, I'm, you know, I feel like I said to these guys earlier, I feel like I'm 65,000 years old. You know, I've, I'm in menopause at the moment and I'm, I'm good, you know, always emotional. But... Um, it gets that way when you're busy and uh, you got a lot. You're, you're trying to carry, not carry people, but um, but I'm just I'm very fortunate to have some amazing people around me who support me and uh, and hopefully I'll be able to leave a legacy. So yeah. And did you want to elaborate on that last bit at all in terms of finding right? I guess right finding um, alignment in values as well is obviously really important, isn't it? I absolutely. I think that. Finding it's a lot like finding a partner, a, a wife, and a, someone you want to spend a long, long time with, uh, and plenty of time with. Um, yeah, it, it it takes, um, and you might be searching for a long time, but it's when you find him, you know. I don't know what the what the word I'm looking for is, but it, it, it's. I was very fortunate. Um, found two incredible business partners who believe in the same things that I believe in. Um, were successful and were willing to take me under their wing to show me the ropes. Um, and I had the same fortunate, um, same luck, I guess, as a 17-year-old football player trying to learn this profession. And, and I had no idea. It was just a couple of people took, them, took me under their wing. They saw that I was willing to work hard and um, the rest is sort of history. I think you, make, you, can, you, you can create your own history, if yeah. that makes sense to, to anyone. Um, and, um, yeah, so really... I said, surrounding yourself with really good people, you generally get good results. And it's amazing the people you, you meet along the journey. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of 
David Lydiard, he, he, he swore he was this amazing NRL player, but I didn't believe it. And <laughs> But it's amazing, you know, we hit it off straight away and he set great examples and I think people, it's like when you raise your own kids, right? You're, mm. you're trying your best to do the best thing for them um, and teach them life lessons along the journey and you don't always get it right, but it's the reaction time to mop up your mess a little bit, I guess. Absolutely. Well, before I throw to um, the final question about what's next for you, does anyone here have any questions that you'd like to ask in the last min few minutes? Okay. Sure, so that's, that's okay. Well, well, I was going to ask, um, you know, Jada, what's next for you? I know that you've been uh, recovering from injury, but using your time quite wisely. And you, you said to me the other day, you really, um, and I think, you know, Michael and David will be really pleased to hear this. You've been quite um, considered in your next choice and, and thinking quite sensibly about that next uh, step after professional sport and, and how you would like to transition. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, like you said, I had a, uh, an injury. I had surgery um, last year, and but I also had that injury for two and a half years beforehand and was managing it on and off. Um, the fact that I had that uh, I really hit me that football's not going to last forever. I, I was 18 when I copped the injury, but it could have been career ending. Like you never know what's going to happen. Um, so really I, I, it put me in a dark spot where I was like, oh, I, like football's everything to me. It's my a lot of my identity, but I'm like, there's a lot more to me than that. Um, and I, I saw where I could maybe add value in the world and uh, and love doing community work. So that's where I really pursued my time. And it gave me the opportunity to really search for more in the world. And then being able to come across people like Michael and David, I'm also considering doing a business degree hopefully soon. And um, I'm wanting to push in those areas of my life. Um, but and then, but having surgery and having the resilience and wanting to get back and have the, uh, the discipline to really do all the work that needed to be done. Um, I'm having the great opportunity to play with Sydney FC this year and start to make my way playing um, in the W League again and hopefully can push for um, the Olympics and the World Cup. Um, COVID actually worked in my favour and the fact that everything got pushed back so I was like sweet <laughs> um, but yeah it, it's uh, I, I can't wait to get back into it and just push myself a little bit more um, and just do the thing that I love. Well I, I have no doubt you're going to go far. Um, I have a final question in the last uh, minute or two uh, and it relates to the final quarter so uh, the the obviously um, moving documentary about um, Adam Goods's treatment on the field, uh, terrible treatment on the field. Um, how do you feel, and Mike, I might ask you obviously first, how do you feel um, it has impacted uh, change, not just on the sporting field in, but in the broader community? Yeah, it's been a great documentary. Um, Shark Island, um, Ian Darling did an incredible job, incredible job. And it actually came, because I'm with Adam nearly every day, every second day, you, t you tend to forget about what happened and the the, the, the struggle. Um, so that was really brought a lot of things back. So it was, it was a lot of tears and, and whatnot and, and thinking back to the past. And it was just a horrendous treatment that Adam had, had copped and the, and the abuse he copped um, and the horrible time that he had to go through. And uh, if you think back, he was the most, I guess, requested and loved AFL player when he was dominating the, the scene there for a long, long period of time. Then he won one award and, it, and the backlash from that was just huge. And that was the Australian of the Year. Mm -hmm. So one award turned everything on its head. It was just uh, incredible, the reaction of people and what they thought they were able to say to Adam and do to Adam. So, um, and I'm very protective of him. He's, he's my little brother. So um, it was really hard, but just thinking back and what we had to sort of, that little struggle or big struggle that we, we had to get through. And my job as his, one of his best mates was just to, to get him up. Mm -hmm. So. You know, and I rocked up to his house one day and he was very flat and uh, I think it was after a West Coast game, I think, and he was really, he was struggling. And so just making sure that my mate was fine, it was okay, and what can I do? So what it's done is it's brought the, 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 the topic of racism back up to the broader community and saying, hey, guys, if you think this, I know everyone in here is pretty much a good good guy, except for one, but... um. It's one of those things that it's actually brought it to the forefront again. Um, 
uh, and your kids ask questions, Dad, what does that what does that mean? Or your daughter asks this question, so you're able to uh, um, articulate it to to your to the younger generation. So um, it's been brilliant to me. People come up the street and they I'll be ordering a coffee and they'll go, Hey, we watched the final quarter and, and I, I had no idea. So I think I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've taken away from the documentary that how many people did not know that this was still happening in Australia. And it was it was mind blowing because I just assumed everyone knew about racism and and that our people have been copying a lot of this garbage for a long period of time. Not and then you talk about someone as high profile as Adam, if he cops it, what are they doing to the bloke up the road at Burke or Wagga Wagga or yeah. back in Adelaide? Yeah. So yeah, brought a lot of it to the forefront. It's been a great conversation, started again about talking about it, but even more so that uh, I think Ian has broken the, the film down a bit to be able to implement it into schools for our younger generation to watch it and call out racism. It's, so racism we see, to you and me, we see someone out there calling us a black so-and-so, but it's actually when you're at your mate's Barbie and a casual racism call about whatever culture or uh, ethnic uh, background you're from and your mate does it and it's really difficult to say to your mate, hey, that's not on. That's not what we're about and I'm your friend and I'm telling you this. Now, the friend has got two ways to react. You can tell me to bugger off or you can go, shit, you know, I, I, yeah, you're, you're right. So that casual racism is alive and well here in Australia and we've got to get better at it, at calling out your friends and your family. And... Um, and hopefully, because guess what? It's like the, your, your son is kicking the footy at the barbecue. He listens. He goes, oh, what's going on over there? Dad and uncle are having an argument about what's going on. Like, so that kind of stuff. So the fantastic, both documentaries, The Australian Dream and, and obviously um, The right. Shark Island, mm, but mm. Yeah. brilliant. We had a trip out to Broken Hill and we were, went out for dinner and we were getting a taxi, trying to get a taxi back to our hotel. I know you've got to finish up, so I'll make this really no, I was just checking and we were right to keep going. I shouldn't have left this question to the end because this is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the taxis kept driving past and we ended up jumping in front of one and stopping them and going, mate, why, don't, why aren't you stopping? We want to ride. And he goes, oh, we don't think the black ball is up after night. So this, you know, this is happening still in this country, you know, and uh, like you said, the marches, the black, black lives matter. So uh, that's an incident that happened with me and him out in, and we, we did, did some workshops out in Western New South Wales. So... It's still alive and well, and um, we've still got a long way to go. And I wonder if it was Ian Darling, the way that he compiled that film as well, <clears throat> excuse me, certainly because people might be aware of different little pockets of activities, but I think the way it was produced and it was so uh, in your face in the sense of, but it needed to be because it was just so dynamic. Every time something would happen, you'd be like, what, what? A mix of emotion. And I was really quite blessed to see it, um, the screening, nine o'clock with the Go Foundation. I had my mm. coffee and thought I was coming in to see. I had no context and, you know, it was. <gasps> um, and just that array of emotion that you felt, that that anger and frustration and upset and all of those things, um, I would think, as you're saying, Michael, it's quite beneficial for people to see that um, as confronting as it is because that's the only way we're going to be able to drive yeah. change. It doesn't matter if you like Adam or not. Watch the movie, come to your own conclusion, and then, you know, that's the way you live your life. Um, and it's, I think it's brilliant, brilliantly put together by Ian and um, very yeah, absolutely watch it with your friends and your, and your family. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we're a couple of minutes over time, so we really appreciate your uh, patience, but we certainly didn't want to cut off and, and I only regret that I didn't ask that a little bit sooner uh, in, in the session. But thank you so much um, uh, for your your time today, your generous um, um, storytelling and, and background, but also what you're all doing for the community as well. And, and I love each and every um, initiative that you're involved with. And I think it's through leaders like yourself um, that we're just going to get stronger each and every day. An amazing company that's been around 30 years and they're most amazing people. So, yeah. That's wonderful. I'm just going to call Michael to, to close today. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Jody. So I'd like to thank our panellists, um, Jada, Michael and David and Jody for moderating the discussion today. It's discussions like these and bodies like Supply Nation that really make a change to the way people view um, our First Nations people here in Australia. So like Magic said, you're either in or you're out. So you really need to make that choice and, and make a change. 
I'd also like to acknowledge Shape, who hosted today's session. They're an amazing partner for us at DLG Shape. Shape have spent over $15 million to date with Indigenous businesses, um, subcontractors and suppliers, including um, Michael O'Loughlin's ARA Indigenous. So I encourage the rest of the business community to get on board. And thanks for tuning in to LinkedIn Live today to watch us. And hopefully you'll tune in again for some further great events like this. Thanks, everybody.